<clears throat> and um, and we're going to go ahead and what I'm going to do today, and like I said, I am not an Egyptian expert. I am a professional historian, and I have a very good historian's level overview of, of Egypt. And that's what I want to give today is kind of what would a basic historian know uh, about Egypt, kind of give you a little bit of that structure, because Egypt is one of those areas I think everybody knows something about. Everybody knows King Tut. Everybody knows Cleopatra. Everybody knows um, about pyramids. But Egypt is an enormous topic. It's 3,000 years of history. And, and we're going to move very fast today. Like I, I was saying earlier, for those of you who weren't here, um, you know, this is a lecture that when I teach it in my World Civ class takes three days, and we're condensing it down to one day. So in order to get through 3,000 years of history very quickly, we need to uh, move kind of fast. So um, what I want to start with today is uh, a little bit of an outline of the geography of ancient Egypt. And I don't know if you can see my cursor on here or not. But um, <clears throat> Egypt is kind of divided into two areas. And here we see a close-up of uh, Egypt in Northeast Africa. And uh, Egypt is divided into Upper Egypt, which is in the South, and Lower Egypt, which is in the North. And this always confuses a lot of my students. Well, why would Upper Egypt be on the lower part of the map? But it has nothing to do with location on a map. It has to do with altitude. Upper Egypt is up in the mountains, and then the river flows down to the Mediterranean. So Lower Egypt is actually in the north along the Mediterranean coast. It's mainly the Nile River Delta. And, um, and then Upper Egypt is everything outside of the Delta region, um, <clears throat> that narrow strip of land along the Nile River. And the Egyptians lived in the northern 750 miles the northernmost 750 miles of the Nile River. The Nile is one of the longest rivers in the world at 4,000 miles long. The reason they only took the northern 750 miles is that's what's navigable by boat. Once you get uh, past about 750 miles down river, you get to what are called cataracts, which are rapids, and you no longer can safely travel by boat. Either there's too many rapids or it's too shallow um, or there, there's too many obstacles. And so they controlled the easily navigable area. Um, Egypt is uh, a 3000 year long civilization with a lot of different periods. Um, and for most of Egypt's history it was a very safe and stable place to live. Um, because, of course, Egypt has one of the best natural defense mechanisms in the entire world, which is the Sahara Desert, especially in its earliest first thousand years of history. We're so far back in time, there really weren't even, you know, uh, ocean going vessels at that time. So you couldn't even really easily sail to Egypt, let alone bring a giant army across the desert to conquer it. So Egypt um, isn't conquered very often in its history. And when it is, it tends to be in later periods rather than earlier periods. So my next slide is the one that always intimidates my students. So if you're looking at the periods of ancient Egypt, there are 10 major periods. And my students see this list and they freak out. They're like, oh my God, I'm never gonna be able to learn this for a test. And I tell them, this is way easier than what you think. So when you're looking at ancient Egyptian history, the three periods everybody needs to know are the kingdoms, the old kingdom, the middle kingdom, and the new kingdom. The big changes and the big eras of Egyptian history are the three kingdoms. What is everything else? Well, the upper and lower Egypt and archaic period is the period of Egypt before it was unified and before they had hieroglyphs. So that is the most ancient period of Egypt. It's the period before pharaohs and before hieroglyphs. So we know very little about that era. 
then you have the old kingdom, middle kingdom, new kingdom, the three big periods, and you see these intermediate periods, first, second, and third intermediate period. I tell my students, intermediate period is a big fancy history word for crisis. There is a crisis that ends a kingdom and brings in a new era. And the crises are all different at different times, which is why we have three of them, but we'll go over them very briefly today. And then you end up with a, uh, a like I said, the third intermediate period, late period, Macedonian kings and Ptolemaic dynasty. All those eras after the new kingdom are when they're conquered by other peoples, the Persians or Alexander the Great and things like that. So there's still Egypt, they still have their culture, but you have foreigners that are acting as Pharaoh and ruling Egypt. So you have the ancient period, you have kingdoms and crises, and then you have foreign rulers. So these periods, and I'll keep coming back to this, uh, this chart, just so we can kind of, it'll help you follow along. But I wanna move on to what I think is the most exciting period in Egyptian history right now, upper and lower Egypt in the archaic period. We know very little about this period, but this is where all the big archeological discoveries are occurring right now. <clears throat> um, so until about 10 years ago, we had found very few artifacts from this period. We didn't even know where to look. And then about 10 years ago, all at the same time, they kind of discovered three different archaic period and upper and lower Egypt period sites. And we started finding artifacts. And so almost monthly, we're finding new things out about the, uh, this period right now. And so I'm gonna show you kind of the two big artifacts that really helped our understanding of this period um, in the last few years. So the first thing I wanna show you is this artifact right here, which is called the Scorpion Macehead. And in the archaic period, um, the first thing that happened was Upper Egypt unified itself into a kingdom of villages with some kind of a leader and Lower Egypt, um, unified itself into a kingdom of villages along the Nile with some kind of nominal leader. And those nominal leaders got more and more power as regional kings, but there's no pharaoh yet because they're independent kingdoms. The archaic period is when they begin to unify. We also don't have hieroglyphs, but what we do have are kind of pictograms, pictures that are trying to tell us almost in comic book form what's going on. So what we see is the picture of a man here who is standing with an army behind him. You see a couple of little figures behind the man. Um, and like I said, I don't know if you can see my mouse on my screen share, maybe not, but you see a couple of man, men at his feet carrying like big palm fronds. Um, you'll notice the big man in the middle is carrying an ax or a scepter and there's a man in front of him kneeling. And the man in the middle is wearing a bowling pin shaped hat. Well, that hat is the crown of Upper Egypt. So this man, we believe, is the first king of Upper Egypt. He is subjugating these villages along the river, forming Upper Egypt for the first time. And because he's got this crown on. And he doesn't have a name, but if you look right in front of his face, right in front of his nose, you will see the image of a scorpion. And so this man has come to be known as King Scorpion or the Scorpion King. And my students also ask me, I'm like, and let me just flat out say, the movie featuring Dwayne The Rock Johnson has zero historical accuracy in any way, shape or form, other than the fact that there was an ancient dude named Scorpion King. Um, and beyond that, we know nothing about him other than he's probably the guy who unified Upper Egypt. And then we go forward some amount of years. How many years? We don't know. But we found what was called the Narmer Palette. And this is the actual artifact. There's a front and a back side. You probably can't see it very well. So I'm going to show you a sketch of it. Now you'll notice on the left is the front side. It's fairly similar. Once again, you see the guy with the bowling pin hat. 
that's the king of Upper Egypt. He's subjugating people again. He's got a guy in his hand who's kneeling, and his army at the very bottom is running away. The bulls at the top symbolize power. And he's got a mace in his head, in his hand. In fact, that scorpion mace head that we just saw, that might be the, the, the ball that's at the top of this mace. Well, he's doing more conquering. And you will notice above the man being conquered is a falcon with a snake in his talons. That falcon and snake was the symbol of lower Egypt. So what we see here is this man by the name of Narmer, sometimes known as Menes. We believe this is him conquering lower Egypt and unifying Egypt for the first time and becoming the first pharaoh. Because when you look at the backside, we see at the top, he now has not just the bowling pin crown, but he's got a big curly cue in the front that represents the cobra. He's wearing both crowns, the crown of Upper Egypt and the crown of Lower Egypt. He's got an army now in front of him. And, and if you look at that top row at the very right side, it's hard to see, but there's a whole bunch of decapitated bodies. Below that are two men who, are, who have captured some dragons. And at the very bottom is a soldier who has been gored to death by a bull. These are all symbols of power and conquest. So we think the Narmer palette is actually reflecting the unification of Egypt. And like I said, this is the period of time that we're finding the most discoveries out right now. Uh, they're coming out monthly. Um, and now you know about everything that I know about Upper and Lower Egypt in the Archaic period. And most historians only know about this level of information. There's, there's not much we know but we're finding artifacts all the time and filling in little gaps. We're finding the names of other kings of Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. And some of these gaps get filled in just about every month. And so this is where all the exciting discoveries are happening right now. So that's the unification of Egypt. Now we move on. We need to talk a little bit about some basic Egyptian mythology if you want to understand Egyptian culture. So Egyptian culture is obsessed with the afterlife. And there were three major gods. Osiris, who was the god of the heavens. Isis uh, was his sister and wife. And people are like, why did he marry his sister? And I'm like, because there's only about three female gods and they're all his sisters. So there's not much choice. So, you know, they're gods. You know, it happens. So, um, and Seth or Set was his brother. And like happens with a lot of mythology, you know, we see in the Marvel movies, we have um, uh, Odin who gives, you know, who has two children, Thor and Loki, and Loki is jealous of the brother. Seth is jealous of Osiris because Osiris gets to be the cool god of everything. And Seth is the god of the underworld. So he gets mad and he attacks Osiris and chops him up into lots of little bits and throws his body into the Nile. And Isis is sister wife is so distraught she magically fetches all the body parts out of the water and heals him and he becomes a human named horus the falcon god and becomes pharaoh on earth and this begins this cycle of reincarnation while on earth he is the pharaoh the god horus and when he dies he rejoins his real body the god osiris in heaven so you have this constant cycle of uh, rebirth on earth as Horus, and then uh, ascension into heaven as Osiris. And so the pharaohs believe that they are the incarnation of the god Horus slash Osiris on earth. And so knowing this helps you to understand why they obsess so much over the pharaoh in believing he is a god. So now we go on to our period's of ancient Egypt again, we are entering the Old Kingdom, which lasted for about 500 years, from 2700 to 2200 BC. Um, the Old Kingdom. What do you need to know about the Old Kingdom? This is what most people think of when they think of ancient Egypt. So we have a period of vastly greater state power and absolutism. There is no separation of church and state. The Pharaoh is God on earth. There's no written law code. Whatever the Pharaoh says is law. Now, with regard to religion at this time, 
Ordinary people did not go to the afterlife. Only the Pharaoh and his immediate family could go to the afterlife when they died. And in fact, this was crucial for the maintenance of their civilization because if, the, uh, if Horus did not reincarnate up into heaven and as Osiris, the civilization would collapse in their mind. So this is the era of pyramid building. Pyramids are arguably the most famous structure that you have in ancient Egypt, and they are pretty much only built in the Old Kingdom. For 500 years, out of 3,000 years of Egyptian history, this is really the only time that the pyramids are built. So this is one of the big characteristics of the Old Kingdom. Absolute rule, pyramid building. And by the way, the pyramids were, first of all, if you're watching History Channel, they're not built by ancient aliens. Let me just, you know, clarify that. We pretty much know how they were built. They were built by human beings. They were also not built by slaves. We know from business records, we know from finding their communities, that the people who worked on the pyramids were laborers that were relatively well paid. Um, as many as 25,000 people were working on a pyramid at any one time, and it took about 25 years to build a pyramid. There are some minor details, such as how did the ramp system work? There were two or three different versions of ramps that we believe might have been used, but most of the other details of pyramid building, we actually kind of know. It's a lot less mysterious than what people think. Um, it's a period of peace. There is no warfare and there are no um, invasions during the Old Kingdom. It's just too remote from the rest of the world. There is trading. I do want to emphasize this is when hieroglyphics were invented. Um, this is a technology that was almost certainly borrowed, by the way. Um, there was debate for a lot of years, what was the first civilization on Earth to develop writing? And it went back and forth. Was it the Mesopotamians? Was it the Egyptians? And they went back and forth and they would push one date back 100 years and another date back 100 years. We've pretty much solved this now. The Mesopotamians were the first to come up with written language. We do know that the Mesopotamians traded extremely profusely with Egypt and was almost certainly a trader who went to Egypt, saw cuneiform, said, man, that's a great idea, written language brought the idea back to Egypt, and they invented hieroglyphs soon after as their own writing system because hieroglyphs develop about 100 years after the first cuneiform is created. Um, during the Old Kingdom, the Egyptian capital was the city of Memphis, which is indeed where Memphis, Tennessee gets its name as well. So where were people buried before pyramids? Well, the Egyptians had what were called mastabas, big trapezoidal platforms with a door, and there would be subterranean chambers. So the tomb would actually be underneath, and then you would go and there would be a temple on, in the, on the surface. You'd have to climb down a ladder to get down into the actual burial chamber. Well, then comes along uh, a pharaoh by the name of Djoser, D-J-O-Z-E-R. And he says, I'm the god Horus. I, I'm going to be reincarnated into Osiris. And they believe that in order to join the afterlife, you had to be mummified. Your body was going to come alive in the tomb and live there. So your body needed to be preserved or your afterlife was over and you needed to be buried with everything. So he said, I need the greatest tomb that has ever been seen. And he commissions a guy by the name of Imhotep to build this. And he says, how could I make a more impressive mastaba? Got an idea. I'm going to build a mastaba on top of a mastaba, on top of a mastaba, on top of a mastaba. And he comes up with the world's first pyramid, the step pyramid, which you can see is still not a perfect, beautiful pyramid. And it's made out of small mud bricks, not giant casing stones that were hundreds of tons and dragged into place. It also has a separate temple complex um, because he's buried underneath the pyramid rather than inside of the pyramid yet. So the step pyramid becomes the first pyramid. And every pharaoh after that wants to improve upon the pyramid. Hey, this is a great idea. Let's improve upon it. 
They didn't have AutoCAD back then. They didn't have computer-aided design. They had to do things by trial and error, and sometimes they erred. And that's where we get the bent pyramid. Um, they tried to build a pyramid that was perfectly smooth, and they built it too steep, at too steep of an angle. And you will notice that the angle of this pyramid changes abruptly halfway up. That's because when this pyramid was half completed, you will notice at the corners of the pyramid, there is damage. That damage is not from 4,000 years of history. That damage occurred at the time it was built. They used mud bricks and the pyramid was so heavy, it began to collapse under its own weight. So they decided, the architects, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? Just cap it off and maybe the Pharaoh won't notice. And he comes to look at this and they just threw a few bricks on the top to finish it. The angle radically changes. And he's like, what is this? Because that, that's your pyramid. Um, and he said, that's garbage, build me another one. And so this pyramid was never used. This was an example of an experiment that did not work. And they learned you gotta use bigger stones and bigger blocks. You gotta stop using mud brick. And you can't make the angle so high, you got to bring it down to a little more normal angle. You have several dozen other pyramids that are built until eventually you come up with one of the seven wonders of the world, the great pyramids of Giza, which were built for the pharaohs um, uh, Khafre, Khufu, and Menacher. Um, and there were three smaller pyramids built, pyramids built alongside for their queens. Um, these pyramids, had very sophisticated um, chambers um, that were meant to deter grave robbers. So they built a big passage underneath the pyramid where most people thought the burial chamber would be because generally, mastabas, they buried people underneath. Well, then they built this passage up and there was a small burial chamber in the middle of the pyramid. And that one was to fake people out too. In fact, they would leave broken pottery and things like that inside to fool people and to think, oh, well, you got in. If you broke in, it's already been looted. Where way high up in the, in the top of the pyramid is where the real burial chamber was. And so you go up through this grand gallery in the middle to the burial chamber. And here you see the staircase, that grand gallery that goes way up into the middle of the pyramid. And you see the actual sarcophagus. Unfortunately, it didn't work and it was looted. Nothing has ever been found inside of the three pyramids except one tiny statue of Khufu that was about three inches tall. And that's the only artifact that has ever been found inside the pyramids other than graffiti. Um, also at the burial complex was of course the famed Sphinx, which we believe was built as a representation of, of Pharaoh Khafre um, at this time. So the Old Kingdom is a wonderful period, uh, a, a golden age for Egypt, but it's going to end. And again, we said intermediate periods are crises. And so we end up in the first intermediate period, which lasted about 150 years. Um, again, intermediate period equals Egyptian crisis. What is the big crisis in Egypt? Oops, we're broke because we spent all our money on pyramids. Pyramids are unbelievably expensive. It was estimated that it took half of the budget of a country for 25 years to build each pyramid. And the problem was this is unsustainable because the other problem you have with the Great Pyramids is it takes too long to build. So let's say the Pharaoh comes to power at age 30. Ancient Egyptians, their average lifespan was only about to 47 years. So let's say they live a normal lifespan. He becomes Pharaoh at 30. They die at 47. That's only 17 years. Well, it's going to take eight more years to complete the pyramid. But we already got to start on the next guy's pyramid. Well, let's say he gets smallpox and he dies after three years. We've got 22 more years on his pyramid. We haven't finished the first one. Now we're on to the third one. Each one costs half the budget of the country. Do you see where the problems are adding up? They cannot possibly afford to sustain 
these gigantic building projects and you see pyramid buildings simply die off. The other problem with pyramid building is they don't work for their intended purpose. Their job, their one job is protect the Pharaoh's body in the afterlife. Don't let it be looted and keep the mummy preserved. Every pyramid was looted within 50 years of construction. Why? Well, the problem is, yeah, they built these incredible structures and they have all these intricate secret passages to stop intruders. Nobody knows about the secret passages except the Pharaoh, the architect, and the 25,000 people building the pyramids every day. So, you know, the problem with secret passages is they only work if they're secret and they were the worst kept secret in the history of secrets, which is why every art, everybody who worked in the pyramid knows, here's the door, don't go down, don't go to the middle, go straight up. And you didn't have to loot everything to be rich. You only had to loot one thing because all this gold and treasure was in there. It made it a super easy target. And they're like, why are we bankrupting the country on these useless pyramids? And that was the end of pyramids. And there was also some climate disaster. Regional governors rebelled against this costly spending. And you have about a year and a, a century and a half of kind of civil war caused by this bankruptcy. And then we enter the Middle Kingdom, which lasted from 2055 to 1650 BC. Okay, so this is a much more socially responsible kingdom. A lot of people call this the golden age of Egypt. Now, they're still spending a lot of money, but the big thing you'd notice about the Middle Kingdom is they're spending on a practical things, roads, granaries, bridges, public temples, irrigation projects, ports, infrastructure that mattered and benefited everyone and improved the civilization. There's also a big religious shift at this time the afterlife was no longer just for the pharaohs. Anybody could get to the afterlife. And we're going to go and we'll talk about that uh, some more in a moment. But you had to be mummified still. Um, you had to be a good person. There is some moral requirement to get into heaven. And you had to have a copy of the Egyptian Book of the Dead to go through the trials to get to the afterlife. The journey to the afterlife was dangerous. Um, and uh, we'll look at that in a moment. Um, you also see the Pharaoh Amenemet I is going to move the capital from Memphis to Thebes, which will remain the capital for most of the rest of Egyptian history. And while there are no written law codes during this period, the Pharaoh had far less power and um, the system becomes much more legally based. There are oral law codes. And so, you do see a much more responsible period. Um, the, the Pharaoh, like I said, is not absolute. You had fair trials and things like that. Um, governance was good. Egypt was broken into regions called gnomes and they had governors called nomarchs. And so this is a very good time to live in Egypt. Um, everybody could go to heaven. Uh, you had good spending practices. There's no invasion. Things are safe. Um, and it's hard even to pick out very many famous pharaohs because they're all kind of equally good. So the Middle Kingdom, we could talk about relatively quickly. And so let me get to mythology part two. How do you get to the afterlife if you're a normal person? Well, you need the Book of the Dead. So as I said, the journey to the afterlife is fraught with peril. There are nine dangerous challenges that you have to pass to get into heaven. And here we have a copy of the Book of the Dead. You could have it painted on your coffin. It could be in a scroll uh, in, your, in, your, in your coffin. It could be painted on your tomb, but you needed to have this roadmap to get to the afterlife. And what we see here is the final trial. So on the left, and you read this like a comic book, there are several scenes. So on the left, you see the jackal-headed god Anubis holding the hand of the recently deceased. And then the next figure over is you see Anubis 
kneeling at a scale. And this is the scale of truth. And Anubis takes the heart of the recently deceased and weighs it on a scale against a feather. And it was believed that every time you sinned in your life, your heart got heavier and heavier and heavier. So they would weigh your heart against a feather. So if you were a good person, um, your name, the next figure over is the Ibis god, uh, Thoth. And he would write your name in the book of life. And then Horus, you see at the entrance there, invites you into the final panel, which is where Osiris is. And he's the green god sitting on the throne. And you would be invited into the afterlife if you were good. But if you were evil, if you look sitting next to Anubis by the scale, is a kind of an animal creature. He has got the rear end of a hippopotamus, the torso of a lion, and the head of a crocodile. He was Amit, the devourer. And if you were evil, then Amit would receive the, the person's soul and devour it horrifically. You would be able to feel all the pain of being devoured as you were eaten up and mashed up in his jaws and eventually go through his digestive tract and be excreted as excrement where you would magically be pieced back together and then you would undergo this process again of being eaten for thousands and thousands of years until the worst fate that could befall any Egyptian would eventually happen to you and that is ceasing to exist entirely. The entire Egyptian culture is terrified of ceasing to exist. And everything they do in their entire life is to make sure that that didn't happen and that they did have an afterlife. Even an afterlife in hell would be better than no afterlife. So they're very, very concerned about this. So people would save up money their whole lives to make sure they had a good copy of the Book of the Dead and could be mummified upon their death. So that brings us to another crisis, the second intermediate period. And for the first time in Egyptian history, they are invaded. This is a very fair comparison, actually. This is Egypt's 9-11 moment. Everything changes for Egypt after this point because they'd never even believed that they could be, could be um, invaded. I mean, realize this is 1650. Their civilization had been around for almost 1,500 years at this point without a single invasion. They had been at peace for, a, you know, 1,500 years. So they are invaded by a group called the Hyksos. So who are the Hyksos? Seriously, I'm asking because I don't know either. Nobody knows who the Hyksos are. They're very mysterious. We, we don't know a lot about the Hyksos. We know, about more, we know more about who they're not than who they are. We know they're not Africans because we've done DNA research on the few bodies that we found of them. They're not African. They are also not from the Near East. They're not Mesopotamian. They're not from Turkey or Anatolia. Um, we're not exactly sure where they're from, but our best guess is Iran or Central Asia, kind of the steps of Central Asia. And a good clue to that is the fact that how were they able to conquer Egypt? Technological super weapon. They were one of the first peoples to domesticate the horse. The horse was the last animal on earth to be domesticated because it's a very difficult animal to domesticate. And the horse was only domesticated around 1750 BC in Central Asia. And with the horse came the chariot. And the chariot in ancient times is like an airstrike, right? So if you've got horses and chariots and your enemy doesn't, what you could do is charge at their front line at 40 miles an hour. You got one guy driving, the other guy has a giant barrel of arrows and he's got um, uh, a bow and arrow and they sweep in really quickly along the front of the line, fire five or six arrows, kill some people and they get out of there. So it's just like an airstrike. Plane comes in, bombs a few people and they get out of there. 
Um, so um, the Egyptians were not able to contend against this. And so the Hyksos take over Egypt for a century. Um, so the Egyptians send, set up a resistance movement out in uh, Upper Egypt in the mountains. Um, they had to sneak into towns in the middle of the night and steal horses um, until they got enough horses where they had their own cavalry. And then they had to learn how to break the horses and ride them because they didn't know anything about saddles or anything like that or even how to ride. So it took them, you know, a couple of decades to figure out how to do that. And then they needed to create chariots. So they had to go south to their to the powerful Nubian kingdom to the south to obtain wood and metal to help their cause and build chariots. And this is something I haven't talked about yet, and we won't probably have much time to talk about today. It is very important to note. Nubia is a powerful black kingdom to the south in what is today Sudan and Ethiopia. It is almost equally as powerful as Egypt. It is just as old. And for most of Egyptian history, those civilizations were partners. They shared the same gods. They would travel to each other's temples. Um, it cannot be overstated how important the Nubian civilization is, but we're simply going to run out of time today if I try to introduce Nubia as well. So this rebellion is led by a pair of bro brothers, Kamos and Ahmos, and they finally get their army together and they've got their chariots and they've got their uh, cavalry and they launch an attack and they are able to successfully overthrow the Hyksos. But unfortunately, Kamos dies in battle, leading Ahmos to victory and Ahmos will become the first pharaoh of the new kingdom. And the new kingdom, they say, we've got this great big army. We're not getting rid of this big army. We're terrified that somebody else is going to uh, invade us. So now we have an era of conquest and expansion. For the first time, Egypt begins to expand. They take over Nubia to the south. They take over Libya. They take over the Sinai Peninsula and Israel, all the way up to the border of the Hittite empire in Turkey. Um, they're unable to conquer Turkey, but they create an alliance with Turkey. And why was Turkey important at this time? The Hittite empire was one of the only two sources of major sources of metals in the ancient world. If you wanted copper and tin to make bronze, if you wanted iron, you either went to Nubia or you went to the Hittites. And this allowed them access to both sources which allowed them more strength for their tools and more powerful weapons. But this is also costly. It costs a lot of money to run this empire and the people weren't necessarily who were conquered very excited to be part of Egypt either. Um, so we have a treat here. Um, it's very rare in history that we get to be able to do this, but because the Egyptians mummified people, I get to actually inter to introduce you today to one of Egypt's greatest heroes. This is the actual mummy of Ahmos I. This is the great man who actually led the rebellion against the Hyksos, successfully overthrew them, and founded the new kingdom. Um, he's looking really good for almost 4,000 years old. Um, just doing better than me, he's still got his hair. So, you know, I mean, that's, you know, I couldn't keep mine for 50 years and he's got his after 4,000, so pretty good. Um, so the new kingdom goes another 500 years from 1550 to 1077 BC. Um, some of the most powerful pharaohs of all time rule during this era, Ahmos, Hatshepsut, um, uh, Akhenaten, Queen Nefertiti, King Tut, um, Seti I, Tutmosis, and of course, Ramses the Great. Um, now, we're back to a period of absolute rule. The pharaohs were once again absolute god kings, and whatever they say was law. Though on the regional level, on a day-to-day -day basis, the nomarchs are still ruling in a reasonably lawful legal way. It's just that the pharaoh, if he issued a command, it overrode all other laws. Um, 
we do start to see another change in religion, not unlike the period just before the Protestant Reformation in Christianity. There were priests and conmen who would sell um, potions, amulets, and spells that they said, hey, if you're not such a good person, take this potion, pour it on the heart of your mummy after you die, it'll temporarily make your heart lighter so you could sneak through the gates, you'll pass the scale test and you'll sneak into um, the, the afterlife. And once you're in, they can't kick you out. So a lot of people would peddle these, not unlike the peddling of indulgences for people trying to get out of purgatory and get into heaven um, during the Protestant Reformation uh, or pri just prior to the Protestant Reformation. Um, so you saw this going on. You also saw burials of pharaohs move to the Valley of the Kings, which we'll talk about in a moment. So among the great pharaohs were the great female pharaoh, Hatshepsut, um, who was one of the most important female pharaohs right behind Cleopatra. Uh, and she was very famous for her incredible mortuary temple in the Valley of the Kings. So now instead of building pyramids, they found a mountain out in the desert in a canyon that looked like a natural pyramid. And they would build temples or they would bore into cliff sides caverns that would have the tombs inside. And then once these structures were built, they would cause an avalanche at the top of the mountain that would bury it forever so that nobody, not even the architects, would be able to know where the entrances were. This worked way better. And most of these tombs weren't looted until after Egyptian civilization was over. So while the Egyptians were alive and guarding this valley, these tombs were intact. And you could see the incredible size of this tomb. Hatshepsut's tomb is literally a recreation of her entire palace, exactly as it was just for the afterlife, fully furnished. So um, it's, it's an incredible structure. Then we also have the incredible Amenhotep IV, better known as Akhenaten. Um, you may remember Amenhotep IV or Akhenaten. He's famous for his family, first of all. He's married to Nefertiti, one of the great queens of Egypt, and his son is King Tut, Tutankhamun. Though his son is not with Nefertiti, it's with his second wife. Pharaohs had multiple wives because pharaohs had to emulate the gods and also marry their sisters. So the primary wife of most pharaohs was their blood sister, which led to a lot of birth defects. There were a lot of handicapped pharaohs, which is why they had second and third and fourth wives, which were not related to give them an heir that might actually live and might not be handicapped. So they had a lot of problems. So Amenhotep IV decided to create a monotheistic religion where they worshiped only one god, the sun god, by the name of the Aten. You can always recognize the sun god and uh, Akhenaten in, um, in images because there'll be this big round disc with rays basking the pharaoh in light, just like in this uh, tile here. Um, now, he says, I'm going to abandon all gods. There's only one true God, the Aten. He even changed his name to Aken Aten, he who worships the Aten. So what did Egyptians think about Akhenaten? They hated him. They despised him. Remember that Egyptian religion by this point had been around for 2,000 years. So what did the Egyptians think? Is there any modern equivalent? Well, let's think. Is there a religion that's been around for 2,000 years today? Sure, Christianity. So if you want to know what people thought of Akhenaten, imagine we're done with this lecture today. You, you turn off Zoom, you go turn on the news, and all of a sudden they've broken into all the news channels. It's on the networks. We're going live to the Vatican where the Pope is going to make an announcement. And Pope Francis comes out on the balcony of St. Peter's, and he's like, Brothers and sisters, Christians of the world, for 2,000 years we have worshipped Christ, the Savior of all. Well, 
recently we've been digging in our archives and new research has shown we sorry we've been totally wrong about this jesus not a real dude didn't exist whole bible was wrong turns out this whole time buddhism was correct so starting tomorrow we're getting rid of christianity we're burning all the bibles tearing down the sistine chapel we're going to burn it you know get the wrecking ball on um saint peter's and notre dame cathedral and we're going to build buddhist temples who knew buddhism correct religion so all hail buddha good night what would people think well first of all whatever type of christian you are even catholics the first thing people would say is oh oh poor pope francis he's got alzheimer's right you know and then people would just feel sorry for him for a couple of days till he actually did bring out wrecking balls and started knocking everything down and then people would get really mad even atheists would get mad because they're like why are you tearing down some of the world's greatest treasures like the sistine chapel to build a new religious temple people were mad and Akhenaten lasted four years and they simply assassinated him. And that was the end of Akhenaten. So I could spend more time on him. He's fascinating, but we only have 10 minutes left. So let's cruise through. Um, Nefertiti is his great wife, his primary wife. This is the famous bust of Nefertiti that we have in um, uh, the Egyptian museum. Um, and then of course we have King Tut. The only tomb of a Pharaoh that has ever been found intact. Why? Because he was so unimportant as a pharaoh, people literally forgot that he was a pharaoh. He came to power when he was just nine years old and he died when he was 18. And basically, <clears throat> the only reason he came to power um, was because uh, the pharaohs, the, the, the priests, hated his dad so much that they said, Look, kid. We're going to be the regents. You're going to do exactly what we tell you, and you're going to bring the old religion back, or we're just going to kill you. And he said, okay. So I guess um, he brought the religion back, and he was basically a puppet for the, the priest. He had very little free will and able to do anything. But because of him, we know about the great treasures of Egypt. Here is his great tomb. The smallest of all the tombs found in Egypt, by the way, only four rooms. He, but everything you needed for the afterlife was in there. You had his burial chamber and three other rooms of his stuff. And here we see pictures um, of the day they opened the tomb. Howard Carter, the great archaeologist sponsored by the wealthy Lord Carnarvon in England, was sent to uncover this tomb. And in one of the most famous moments of archaeology, he takes a pick and opens a hole through the door and he peers in to see if the tomb has been looted and he shines a flashlight and everybody's crowding behind him and they say dr carter dr carter what do you see what do you see and he turns around and he simply says wonderful things and at that moment people knew that the tomb had not been looted now we're going to move on because you could do a whole lecture just on king tut and his tomb and the wonderful artifacts found there but I want to get through the rest of history, which is not as well known. So we do have the Valley of the Kings. I do want to show you the pyramid-shaped mountain there at the top that dominated the Valley of the Kings. And you can see why they chose the location. It does indeed look like a natural pyramid. And then on the bottom, you see the cliffs where they've been excavated, and they've dug out the rubble where they buried all of these tombs into the cliffside. And we have a map today of the Valley of the Kings. We've discovered 62 royal tombs um, in the Valley of the Kings so far, including King Tut. Most of the New Kingdom pharaohs, we have discovered their tombs and their mummies. And that leads us to the greatest leader in Egyptian history, which is Ramses II, also known as Ramses the Great. There he is looking excellent for 4,000 years old. And and I decided just for this Zoom lecture, I would rock the Ramses the Great pharaonic haircut for you, um, as you can see. Uh, the first thing that, that most people notice about Ramses is we always think of him from like the Ten Commandments and, and you know, Charlton Heston as being young, but he was incredibly old when he died. He was 88 years old, and his mummy looks like an 88-year-old. 
Um, a very good 88 year old, but nonetheless, um, he had really good health care for the time period being the pharaoh. His father, Seti I, was a powerful pharaoh in his own right. He was one of those that undertook great building projects and uh, expanded the empire and also took over, tried to take over the Hittite empire, but ended up with a friendly alliance with them. He was also responsible for the great uh, uh, monument of Abu Simbel, um, uh, a monument, uh, two monuments, one to his family, one to his wife's family that were carved into the side of mountains um, at Abu Simbel, which is at the furthest south point on the Nile River, just before you get to the first cataract. This was put on the border between Nubia and Egypt. It's kind of like the welcome center when you enter Egypt, just like today, you know, when you drive from Tennessee into Alabama, you got the, the rest area that's got the big rocket. When you drive into Georgia, you got the big sign, welcome to Georgia, and you could go pick up pamphlets on what there is to do in Atlanta and Georgia and things like that. This was that. Welcome to Egypt. Look at our power. Look at our powerful pharaohs. Um, an interesting thing about Abu Simbel is not only is it one of the most famous Egyptian monuments, but it is also a great feat of modern engineering because in 1973, they had to build the, um, the Aswan High Dam because Cairo was running out of water and power. But when they built this dam, which created uh, uh, Lake Nasser, it was going to flood Abu Simbel. So they literally had to take machines and they carved the entire temple piece by piece out of the mountain relocated at several hundred feet higher up onto the top of where the mountain is. And they built, as you can see at the bottom, two fake mountains out of concrete and set the temple into these fake cliff sides. Um, so you have the real temple surrounded by a fake concrete mountain that's painted to look like a mountain. They're just hollow. They're literally made out of steel and, and, uh, and cement but they managed to save these two great temples. And you could see how close the Nile River is to the temples today. The original location is 100 feet underwater and a couple hundred feet out into the uh, Lake Nasser there. Um, so this is not only a great feat of ancient engineering, but modern engineering as well. So showing you where we're at, we're about to get into this last period and we're gonna fly through it really quick. We now end up in the third intermediate period lasts for about 400 years. From this point on, Egypt never truly ruled itself again. It began to be dominated by outside powers. First, the Libyans invaded and took over as pharaohs for a brief time period. And then the Nubians invaded. For the first time in history, they had generally had a positive alliance for most of their uh, uh, existence, but Nubia invaded. Uh, King Kashta of Nubia conquered Thebes in 750 BC, and his son Pianki conquered Memphis, thus gaining control over all of Egypt. And Pianki became pharaoh of Egypt and founded the 25th dynasty, which ruled Egypt for 100 years. You have a line of black African pharaohs from Central Africa who are ruling Egypt as pharaohs. Um, and then in 671, they were overthrown by the Assyrian Empire of Mesopotamia. And the Assyrians conquered just about everybody at some point, but they only ruled Egypt for about eight years. Um, and we can see here a statue, a bust of Pharaoh Pianchi, the first um, Nubian Pharaoh of Egypt. A really fascinating time period. Another era where we're finding a lot of new artifacts in the last few years is the Nubian dynasty. So you have conquest after conquest after conquest. Egyptian culture stayed intact. They still believe in their gods and their mummies and everything, but you had outside powers acting as Pharaoh. And the Assyrians get replaced in the late period, 664 to 332 BC. This is the period they're conquered by the great Persian empire. The same one that you see in the movie 300 that tried to kill the Spartans at Thermopylae. Um, the Persians took over Egypt 
for almost 300 years, two to 300 years. Um, they're conquered by, uh, they're led by Cambyses II, the son of the founder of the Persian Empire, Cyrus the Great. And Cambyses II starts a Persian dynasty line. And that lasted till 332 BC when we get Alexander the Great. And now the Greeks conquer Egypt. So 332 to 305 BC is the period of Alexander the Great and his general Ptolemy. Um, and he defeated the Persian Empire once and for all. And now the Greeks are going to control Egypt for the next 300 years. And he decided to, as he did frequently, to build a grand new capital that combined the best of Egyptian culture with the best of Greek culture, the Hellenistic civilization. And he, he said, well, we need to build it on the coast so that we can quickly communicate with mainland Greece. And he goes, what should we name it? What should we name it? And Alexander the Great being one of the great, you know, egotistical maniac, maniacs of all time said, I know, we'll name it after myself and call it Alexandria. By the way, Alexander the Great also founded 44 other cities across the Middle East and Central Asia, all of which were named Alexandria. So this is, creates a huge headache for historians because there's literally like 45 ancient cities named Alexandria. So we literally have to number them so we know which one we're talking about. Oh, there was a great discovery at Alexandria 27 the other day. You know, and, and, and he literally, that's the only name he ever used. So, but the, if they don't use a number, it's always referring to Alexandria, Egypt, which of course is still there today. It's still a modern city of about 4 million people. It's bigger than Atlanta. Um, one of the other great wonders of the world that he constructed was the Pharaoh's Lighthouse, um, the first of its kind. It allowed for safe ship travel on the Mediterranean. You could see the light from 40 miles away out at sea at night, but what people forget is because it was just a great big giant burning bonfire at the top, this was about 300 feet tall, you could see the smoke for hundreds of miles. So if you were on the Mediterranean in the daytime, it was super easy to navigate to, to Alexandria. Just aim for the smoke. You didn't even know how to sail. Just aim for the smoke and you'd get there. And um, it stood until the early 1500s when unfortunately it collapsed in a great earthquake. But it stood long enough that we have um, actual, actual um, evidence. Um, Christopher Columbus actually wrote in his diary that he took a trip to Egypt and actually saw the lighthouse of Alexandria before it collapsed. Um, so it was around as recently as that. Um, and by the way, they have found the ruins of this, and they are in the process of excavating it and trying to rebuild at least the base of the, the lighthouse. They'll never rebuild all of it. but they think they might be able to build at least maybe a third of the bottom portion of the base. Um, this was also home to the great library of Alexandria, the first and largest of the great libraries of the world. It contained a rumored 350,000 Greek scrolls, Egyptian papyri, and Mesopotamian cuneiform tablets, information from all of the known civilizations of the world. Um, and it was free for people to come use. There were other great libraries, the Library of Ephesus in Turkey, the Library of Pergamon in Turkey, but this was the original, and it burned down sometime after the conquest of the Romans, sometime between Cleopatra and about 300 AD. You also hear a lot of rumors about, oh, all the knowledge that was lost in Alexandria, we'd be a thousand years more advanced if it hadn't burned down. Uh, probably not, because most of the things in Alexandria had, just like libraries today, hundreds of copies that were made and were in other copies of libraries all around the world. There were things lost in Alexandria for sure. Most of the science-y kind of thing, we think not. Even what was there and was lost, we have records of what was lost from people who were around when it burned. So we kind of have some ideas that it may be, well, it was devastating, it's not as devastating as maybe we tend to associate with it today. And then that brings us to our last pharaoh, the last pharaoh of all, one of the most famous, Cleopatra. We are now in the Ptolemaic dynasty, 
which is the dynasty of um, the heirs of Alexander the Great. And this went from 305 to 30 BC. All of the pharaohs are now Greeks. They're ethnically Greek. They would not have even looked Egyptian. They didn't even speak the Egyptian language. The only Egyptian pharaoh during the Ptolemaic dynasty who could even talk to her own people without a translator was Cleopatra. She was the only one who even bothered to learn the local language. Um, she was very intelligent, well-spoken, highly educated, and of course had famous love affairs with both Julius Caesar and uh, Mark Antony. Um, famously, she had problems giving birth to her son, Caesarian, by Caesar and had to have surgery to have the baby removed. And this is where we get the Caesarian section today. This is the first recorded instance of the C-section surgery. Um, the Egyptians knew how to do this pr procedure 2,000 years ago. Unfortunately, it would have been a horrific procedure at that time because they didn't know about sterilization. You only did this if it was a certainty that the labor was so going so poorly that the woman was going to die because only about 15% of people survived the procedure and there's no anesthesia. So they're just cutting you open awake. They'd be like, here's a bottle of the hardest alcohol we can find. Swig that whole thing. Here's a stick, you know, good luck and uh, bite down. And they would cut you open, take the baby out, sew you back up and maybe you survive the pain and maybe you survive the infection. Cleopatra did. It would clearly, some people survived. It was used only as a last resort though. Um, she had two more children with Mark Antony, but of course she was famously on the wrong side of the Roman civil war. Mark Antony versus Octavian to see who was gonna be the successor to Julius Caesar. Octavian wins the war. Mark Antony commits suicide, so does Cleopatra. Had Cleopatra been captured, she would have been brought back to Rome, paraded around, tortured publicly for days, and brutally executed. She did not want that, so she famously clusped an asp, a cobra, to her breast and committed suicide. From that point on, the Romans take over Egypt, and Rome now owns Egypt. And it is a Roman province, you see the slow end of Egyptian religion. You see it replaced with uh, the, the hieroglyphics are replaced with Latin and Greek. Um, and the unique Egyptian culture is ended and rule is imposed outside of the country by Rome. So that's how it differs from these other periods where you had other people dominating it. The Persians ruled as a local pharaoh. The Assyrians ruled as a local pharaoh. The Nubians ruled as a local pharaoh. The Romans ruled from Rome and overtook their own culture. And that brings us to the end of the lecture. So um, I am uh, welcome to open to uh, any questions that we might have here. Let me go back a few slides um, to, um, I just want to put up the list of the, the period so we can have, yeah, have that to look at for any questions. Um, but uh, does anybody have any questions over anything from Egyptian history? Uh, First question. Uh, our, yes, okay, our Vinick. Yeah, how does the exodus from uh, Egypt correlate with the old Bible? Any evidence that it really existed as currently thought of? That's a great question and one that if I had more time, I was going to cover in the lecture. It's a super interesting topic because we have a sort of a problem with that in Egyptian history. We have no evidence from the Egyptians whatsoever that Moses actually ever existed. He's never mentioned in hieroglyphics. There's no evidence of the Jews being in Egypt at that time. That doesn't mean that they weren't, but we've never found any physical evidence from the Egyptian side. Um, we also don't even know what Pharaoh is supposed to be the actual Pharaoh from the Exodus. A lot of people naturally assume it's Ramses the Great, and he's a good candidate for it. 
but it could also have been Tutmosis III. There are a couple other candidates because he's never named, he's just called Pharaoh. Um, so there's a few possibilities for what Pharaoh it could have been. So here's the other problem we have in Egyptian history, and it's a sort of a half propaganda and half superstition, a superstition that was very much encouraged by the pharaohs. The pharaohs never wrote down anything bad in hieroglyphics. It was considered superstitious. If you wrote down bad events, a record of something bad that happened, they believed that magically that could create other bad things to happen. So you only wrote down positive things. For example, we didn't know that the Hyksos had conquered Egypt for 100 years until we found the tomb of Ahmos and it said, yeah, I was the guy who defeated the Hyksos because that was a victory. And all of a sudden historians were like, wait a minute, who were the Hyksos? Who were these guys? And they had to do all this archaeology to figure out who the Hyksos were. The invasion is never spoken about, only the victory over them. And so we've had to use archaeology to go back and piece that together. And similarly, you know, we have problems with the archaic period because we couldn't say anything about it because they didn't have any records. So if you can't find the artifacts, we don't know anything about it. So here's the problem. If Moses didn't exist, there would be no evidence to find. If he did exist and led a successful slave rebellion that liberated the Hebrews against one of the most successful pharaohs of all time, Ramses or Tutmosis, they're all really good pharaohs at this period, they would never record those details. They would have had that chiseled out and wiped from memory. So the problem we have from the Egyptian side is if Moses didn't exist, there's not going to be evidence. If he did exist, there's not going to be evidence except archaeological evidence, and we haven't found archaeological evidence. Now, an absence of evidence doesn't mean it didn't happen. It just means we have no evidence. So the frustrating thing that we have is it's something that if we don't find evidence, we might not ever be able to prove. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. Doesn't mean it did happen, but we just literally can't say anything about it from the Egyptian perspective. But it's one of these big problem areas of history. We really can't talk about it from that perspective. And that's a problem. And uh, we acknowledge that problem. But it's very fascinating of why we can't talk about it. So but thank you. That's a great question. Another, I have a, a question. Uh, sure. Uh, any uh, references uh, regarding uh, how the pyramids were built? Um, yeah, we have a lot of evidence for how the pyramids were built. A lot of that comes from archaeology. Um, a lot of it comes from uh, the actual architect's marks. As we've gone into the pyramids, you can actually, if you go above the king's chamber where he was buried in the Great Pyramid, and you go into the supporting structure, there's some gaps under uh, up above where they made kind of a false uh, arch. And you could still see the, the draftsman lines and, and like where they would take measurements and they, they have numbers written down of like how big things had to be. And so uh, we found where the stonemasons, we found the quarries where they've quarried the stone. We know that bricks were transported from the quarry um, down the Nile and then dragged from the Nile to the, uh, to the pyramids. We have found the uh, uh, villages surrounding the pyramids while they were being built and the homes of uh, middle-class foremen uh, that talk about, I am, uh, you know, and, and we find their graves and it say, I was the foreman of, you know, 300 men who worked on the pyramid their job was, you know, carve stone or their job was to drag stones. Um, some of the details that we don't know are, was the ramp to take stones to the pyramid, did it spiral around the pyramid? Did you have one ramp that went up each side? Did you have a giant ramp that went to the top? We tend to think that it spiraled around and then it was disassembled as the casing stones, the final casing stones were laid. So they built the rough structure to the top then they would take the fine stones, build it from the top down, and then they would spiral down and remove the ramp. 
uh, as they uh, as they uh, finish. And um, and the pyramids used to have very fine, beautiful, polished casing stones made out of white marble. Um, that would add inscriptions and things like that. But that marble was very expensive. And during the um, uh, Middle Ages, other civilizations, the Arabs in Cairo, stole stones from the sides and they uh, used them in other structures. So very few of the original casing stones still exist. You can still see a few, um, but uh, most of them are gone. now. Um, but because we have found the homes and the tombs of some of these foremen, we have a pretty good idea. We found tools. We, we, we know how they did drafting. Um, we found some papyri uh, that talk about some of the procedures that they use, um, how much people were paid. People were paid well. Um, you, you could make a decent middle-class living as a pyramid construction uh, person. Um, but uh, we do know that they weren't slaves. Um, what about transporting the large stones up the ramp any uh, um, how, how, that is how they good, did that <laughs> that's a good question and there's still debate over that um okay. there's debate over whether they used logs or whether they didn't use logs we're starting to believe that they didn't use logs they might have had them on some kind of a sledge um and that the sand would have been wet um so that it would have they that the the weight of the stone would not have uh, sunk into the sand. So they would have had some kind of irrigation ditch temporarily that would have been able to wet the way. And then it's just sheer manpower dragging these stones, you know, hundreds or even thousands of uh, both men and probably oxen. Uh, it would not have been horses because they wouldn't have domesticated the horse at that point. That didn't come till the second, you know, intermediate right. period. So um, we think oxen and men would have dragged the stones. Um, but there is debate still over those techniques, and you can find uh, a number of different theories online, but we think it's just sheer manpower on sledges being dragged, probably on wet sand. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. You showed that uh, when the upper and lower kingdoms united, that they had the symbols regally of, of the falcon and the yes. cobra thing. Is there any link of that to the Mexican flag that has the eagle and the snake? No. Um, the Now, that I could tell you about. So there is an Aztec legend. The reason you have that symbol on the Mexican flag, um, there is an Aztec legend. Um, the Aztecs actually were a relatively recent tribe. They only actually ruled as a powerful empire for 150, 200 years. And they used to be kind of a wandering nomadic tribe that kind of got kicked around a lot. And there was a legend that their god Quetzalcoatl told them that said, you will know where to found your civilization. I will send you this sign when you see an eagle eating a serpent on a cactus. That's where you build your civilization. And supposedly they saw that symbol on Lake Texcoco on an island. And so they built their civilization on this island, which turned out to be a great place in Mexico to build a civilization because it's on the largest freshwater lake in Mexico. So you've got access to water in the desert. It's an island, so it's very defendable. Um, and that symbol of the Aztecs, the Aztecs did not call themselves the Aztecs. That was a Spanish name for them. They called themselves the Mexica, M-E-X-I-C-A, which is where you get the name Mexico. And so they took that logo from that legend from the Aztecs and they put that on the flag. Um, this is where we found it. And then, of course, Tenochtitlan, which was their capital, becomes Mexico City when it's conquered by the Spanish. Um, and so that's why that symbol is on there. But, yeah, there is no connection between that and Egypt whatsoever, nor is there any connection with the Mayan or Aztec pyramids and the Egyptians. Um, it's... Pyramid building happened in a lot of cultures. It happened in China. It happened in Southeast Asia. It's the easiest shape to build. You build something big on the bottom and you build smaller on the top. It's really easy, it turns out, to build pyramids. And that's why you see it commonly, um, in, including platform mounds, which are similar to pyramids or mastabas here at Moundville, right here in Tuscaloosa, right? So um, 
it's it's a very common uh, building technique. So we, we just think it's coincidental. So, um, and um, I'm trying to see through if anybody else has any questions, raising their hands and so on. We have any other questions? Um, if not, I could take a moment and I could talk about Nubia if you'd like to hear about that. I actually do have a slide prepared for that, just in case I had a couple seconds. Um, let me go through. Because it's a tragedy to talk about Egypt without talking about Nubia. Nubia was just as powerful as Egypt um, and extended south through all of Sudan and into Ethiopia. Uh, Nubia, by the way, is the name of a region rather than any particular country. And there were several countries that went through Nubian civilization, just like you had the Sumerians and the Assyrians and the Babylonians in Mesopotamia. You had the kingdom of Cush, the kingdom of Moro, the kingdom of Aksum, and then eventually the kingdom of Ethiopia. And they had, um, Cush was around during the New Kingdom. Uh, and traded metals with them. They were close allies. Um, the gods, the pantheon of Egypt, actually originated in Nubia. The gods of Egypt were Nubian gods that were adopted by the Egyptians. Um, and um, some Nubian temples, like the Temple of Amun-Ra, were so large that we have records of Ramses the Great made a pilgrimage to the kingdom of Cush just to visit their temple of Amun-Ra. So there's a very close relationship there. Uh, later on, when we get to the third intermediate period and we have the kingdom of Moreau, you could see the great pyramids of Moreau. They built their own pyramids. And you will notice there, this is 2000 years already after the Egyptian pyramid building uh, phase. They were building these pyramids because they were inspired by great Egyptian architecture. And you'll notice the entrances look like the temple of Karnak uh, in Egypt as well. Um, by the way, these pyramids in the front, these are not reconstructions. They're that well preserved. Um, unfortunately, the pyramids of Moreau are in a very dangerous part of Sudan. So it's very inaccessible and hard to get there, which is why a lot of people haven't heard of them. But um, their pyramids served a slightly different purpose. They were just mausoleums. You went in the door and they just had coffins of the various um, royal families of Moreau. And that was it. Um, there's no treasures or anything in there uh, and so on. And then when we got to the Roman period, we had the great kingdom of Aksum, which is near, e which is in Ethiopia today. And they built these great steles that had hieroglyphics that told about each, each of these big towering stele, except for the giant one in the middle talked about one of their great pharaohs uh, that ruled Aksum, their great kings. Um, this was a metal working community. This was the first industrial civilization in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, they made iron uh, and they had hundreds of factories that smelted iron for tools to all the great civilizations. They sold to the Romans, they sold to the Greeks, to the Egyptians and so on. And they believed that, well, there's nobody buried here. These are just monuments to their kings. But this big stele in the, in the bottom right, they, you'll notice there's a fake door. There's a stairwell and a fake door at the bottom. They believed that they could get to heaven and to Osiris. They would use this kind of like as a spiritual elevator. Their souls could walk through the door and shoot up to the heavens in the daytime and in the nighttime, they could come back to visit family and friends and check up on them and kind of walk the earth um, at the nighttime when we didn't see them and so on. So just as an addendum, I just wanted to bring that up and, uh, and just briefly mention about uh, the Nubians. They're another really great civilization that is worthy of uh, a lot of study. Um, uh, William, you had a question there. Oh, your, your hand was raised. But, um, um, anybody else with any questions? Well, Thomas, this was a very, very interesting presentation. I want to thank you on behalf of everybody here. 
And unless we have any other, I'll, uh, I'll ask one more time. Any more questions before we end the session? Okay. Thank, Thank you for you. coming. Thank, Thank you, you so Chris. much for having me. It was really fun, to, and uh, we'll have to do this again. I've got plenty more topics stored in my brain that we could go over. So um, it, it's a lot of fun for me. So great, well, glad I could be here. We'll be in touch. Thank you so much. Thanks. Hope you do, hope you do come back, and uh, we'll see everybody tomorrow morning at nine thirty for the next session. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good evening, afternoon. Nine thirty. What he said.